This is How to Drink the Show. I make cocktails and how to drink them. And this is Watch Tales, a series where I am partnered with Crown and Caliber. We're going to look at two watches today and pair them up with cocktails that suit them. Cocktails that complement these watches the way these watches need to be complemented that do that voodoo that you do so well. It's cool when I do that, right? Today we're talking about what we call square pegs. These are watches that are a little bit outside the norm. So this is the Panerai Radio Mirror 1940. The 1940 has a different lug setup than the standard wired lugs that you will find on a Panerai. It is a square case, round dial, rose gold watch. Now, there's so many things about this watch that are kind of, I guess backwards in a way. Panerai, probably the case design, which is what they're most iconically famous for, it's probably invented by Rolex. So it's in a weird way, it's like a Rolex, it's a backwards Rolex. Rolex had these cases that they didn't know what to do with. Panerai kind of bought them and put their own watches in it for the Italian Navy. And I honestly, I, I don't see a ton of rose gold Panerais when I run into them. And so it's a backwards -er Panerai. It's Italian watch. I think we gotta look at Italian aromatic wine, but backwards, I'm thinking a reverse Manhattan. I think a reverse Manhattan is the drink to pair with the Panerai Rose Gold 1940 Radio Mirror. I really actually, I like this watch a lot. I think that this is a watch I could really wear. This is, feels a little dressy for me, but I'm kind of into it. I don't know. So this is a stirred drink. It's a reverse Manhattan. Um, I've made a Manhattan on the show. And actually, you should probably check that out. That's a really great place to start before you get into the reverse Manhattan. Reverse Manhattan is that. It's a Manhattan that's reversed. It favors the aromatic wine and uses the rye as a modifier. So it's gonna be a little bit lower in proof. Still a pretty in your face drink and a respectable cocktail, great cocktail. I'm gonna start by adding two dashes of Angostura bitters to my mixing glass. A little, a little slow, one, two. There we go, two dashes of Angostura bitters. I want two ounces of Punta Mez in my jigger. Well, actually I want it in my in my mixing glass, but it's gonna have to start out in my jigger to get into the mixing glass, right? And this is a vermouth de uno, un punto de vermouth. It's an aromatic wine. Vermouth comes from wormwood, so all of these vermouths, aromatic wines, have a little bit of wormwood in them as a flavoring component. Would you like to know what uh, Punta Mez tastes like? Mm. Orangey, bittery, that's delicious. I really like Punta Mez. <laughs> It's gotta be one of my favorite aromatic wines. I just love it. It has a lot of bite. It's kind of almost on its way to Campari or something, but not nearly as bitter, but it's it's leaning towards the very bitter end of the spectrum for vermouths. And we want one ounce of rye. I'm going with my favorite rye, Rittenhouse, bottled in Bond. At this point, this drink is ready to stir. That's it, it's a three ingredients. It's very simple, rye, uh, vermouth, and Angostura bitters. Stir this drink up, you know, generously. We're gonna strain that drink into a coupe. And we're gonna garnish that with a uh, maraschino cherry. I prefer Luxardo. Although there is no label on my little jar, it's because I'm pulling these from a huge industrial size can of the suckers. So trust trust me, these are Luxardo maraschino cherries. Cherries? But cherries, Greg. Um, you know what? I like them enough, let's put two in there. And so here we have a Panerai Radio Mirror 1940 with ro in a rose gold with a reverse Manhattan. I love that. Ooh. This is spirit forward. The vermouth really takes over at the front and somehow between the garnish and the rye and the vermouth, they kind of combine to give a really impression of sort of a bitter cherry. It is delightful. I am super into this. I guess the ango could be playing a part in there. It gives way to a little bit of that, that vermouth, that bite from the wormwood, from the bittering, from the angostura, but it finishes in a really nice, mellow sweetness that is just right on the money. That is a fantastic drink. That is something you could definitely spend a little time with. You know, mixing it up, working your way around the room, flashing little rose gold from the Panerai Radio Mirror 1940. 
Excellent drink. Excellent watch. They go together so well. So well. Let's switch watches. We've got a Tog Heuer Monaco. So the Monaco was introduced in 1969 by Heuer before they were bought out by Tog. It's a first in a number of ways. It's the first uh, water resistant square watch. It's also largely considered to be the first automatic chronograph. It has a built-in chronograph stopwatch uh, function. There's a pusher, it's ticking, tick, 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 tick. Stop it, reset it with a flyback. Automatic in that it, it winds that function, that complication up entirely off the movement of your wrist. It's pretty much always at the ready to go. You never have to wind it. That was a big innovation. A lot of companies are working on that. Um, and Hoyer got to the market first. Truth be told, uh, a couple of other companies um, may have had the same innovation at the same time, but Hoyer gets the credit, of course. It's famous for being the McQueen watch because Steve McQueen wore one uh, in the film Le Mans. That kind of set this watch up as a race watch, but really, ew. it's not a Hoyer Octavia or a Carrera. You know, this is not a race car driver's watch, but because Steve McQueen wore it while playing a race car driver in Le Mans, it got that reputation, kind of caught on. It's certainly eye-catching in that square case, very unique for the time. I mean, still very unique. There's not a lot of square watches out there. And frankly, it looks pretty damn cool on the wrist. Thinking about that mid-century time and being just a little bit adjacent to normal, which is what this watch is, I think the drink I would pair this with is a Gibson which is a drink that was very popular in the mid-century. It is a variation on a martini. Um, it is, in all respects, a martini made a little bit different by its garnish. Instead of a twist of lemon or an olive, we garnish it with a pickled onion or two. Origins of the Gibson are interesting. I have read that it had to do with a particular diplomat who uh, was a teetotaler and didn't want to drink at his parties, and he had a glass of water uh, that in the martini glass, and to make sure he knew which was whose, he had his garnished with a onion instead of an olive. That way he didn't accidentally pick up the ones filled with gin. Cool story, I don't know that that really holds up. It's the best origin story I've got on hand for a Gibson. At any rate, let's just make a dang gone Gibson. It's a stirred drink, as all martinis shall be. I'm gonna start making this with a dash of orange bitters. You know, if you like two dashes, that won't ruin the drink. And I like to. Um, now I want some dry vermouth. A few options here. I think a martini should be made with a French vermouth. I think Dolan is an excellent choice. I think um, Noely Pratt makes a nice dry vermouth as well that could be suitable here. We're gonna make this one on the dry side. So we're gonna use a one ounce of Dolan dry vermouth. We're trying to keep this drink mid-century. When I make a traditional gin martini or, or a dry martini, I get much closer to a 50-50 ratio between vermouth and gin. I'm gonna keep this one towards that mid-century leaning in recognition of one, the watch that we're looking at from 1969, and two, the feeling that we get from it and the, the sideways sort of nature of the whole thing. I'm gonna use two and a half ounces of London dry gin. Kind of a fat pour. Crack some ice in that and stir it up, and we've got ourselves a Gibson. All right, we'll stir that guy up. We're gonna serve this in a Nick and Nora glass. And we're gonna garnish that with a pickled pearl onion on a pick. Sunk the bottom. You can lose the pick. Um, I like the pick in case I wanna pull it out and take a bite of it. Here we go, this is a Gibson cocktail. Uh, bottom is up, as I say. That is, that is refreshing, that is crisp. The gin is really mellowed here by the melt water and by the vermouth. And believe it or not, right after that blast of juniper, which comes in slightly delayed, I get like almost nothing. And then like a blast of juniper and citrus from the orange bitters, you get just a wisp of vanilla from the vermouth. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what I'm getting. I mean, I, I, I like this drink very much. Now, truth be told, this is not my personal favorite style of martini to drink, but it is an excellent incarnation of the Gibson mid-century style. 
I mean, the main difference is the garnish. The choice of garnish kind of makes it a Gibson. And that's the idea, right? Like, so that's pickled, so that pickled onion will impart some of its pickled brine into the drink. I mean, some people like to splash it on in there, make it fully dirty. I don't know, I think a martini should be pretty crisp, to be honest. I, I don't want it to be oily. I think an oily martini is a mistake. And this isn't that, this is definitely um, fresh, crisp, smooth, dry. Today I looked at two kind of odd duck square peg watches and I paired them up with what I would consider to be odd duck square peg cocktails. I like both of the watches equally. Um, I'm probably more a fan of the reverse Manhattan than the Gibson, but I wouldn't send the Gibson back. That's, a, that's an acceptable drink. I like that very much. It's just, you know, different strokes for different folks. It may not be exactly my cup of tea, but it might be yours. I'm on Twitter at How To Drink. I'm on Instagram at How To Drink. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash how to drink. If you like the show, um, I hope you will subscribe and ring a ding dang dong that bell. So swing on by Crown and Caliber. These guys have helped over 30,000 people buy and sell watches. Really, there is no better place to buy or sell a watch. They've got articles, blog posts, and videos on their YouTube channel that will really help you set yourself up and uh, start hunting for the grail watch of your dreams. The finer things in life like this delectable onion. Well, that's fun. Gin-soaked onion. I get traveling carnival, I don't know why. Let's see how these cherries do. Oh, it's like a candy shop, that's delicious. Cherries win, guys. Cherries over onions, both great though.